Hello and welcome to this third session, session number three of our series entitled uh, Biblical Money Management 101. And we are using for our outline, Larry Burkett's How to Manage Your Money, an in-depth Bible study on personal finances. Before we get underway, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Our Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for your word. It is indeed a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. It is our greatest source of wisdom. It meets our greatest needs. And we look to you now for guidance in this area of biblical money management. That you would open our minds to understand your word and help us when we understand your word to put it to practice in our lives. Be with us now in this time. May the spirit of God teach us. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Today we're going in session number three, it's entitled The Perils of Money. And we're going to start off this session number three, The Perils of Money, by considering servitude to money. Now, just as God uses money to enhance and direct our lives, Satan will use it to shackle us. Christians could, should learn to recognize the danger of money entanglements and financial bondage. What is bondage? Well, until recent times, the 1800s, financial bondage meant precisely that, physical bondage. If a man could not pay his debts, he was thrown into debtor's prison and his family then belonged to the lender. In scripture, we see, we see the same practice enforced against debtors. In Matthew chapter five, verses 25 and 26 says this, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. This is the wisdom of trying to reach an out-of-court settlement before this thing gets before the judge. Agree with your adversary. Come to an agreement. Come to some terms of agreement about how to handle this situation. And hopefully you can, you can settle it out of court. There'd be no need to go any further. Physical bondage no longer exists. but it has been replaced by another that is equally bad. And that is worry or mental bondage. Thousands of families each year are destroyed by financial worries caused by financial pressure. Why? Because they have violated one or more scriptural principles. It is not simply the lack of money that results in bondage. Many times an abundance result in mental anguish. If there is too little, people worry about gaining more. And with too much, they worry about losing it. 
It is always attitude that is reflected in God's word. Proverbs chapter 30, verses seven through nine says this, two things I asked of you, do not refuse me before I die. Give me neither. Keep lies and deception far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I be not full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. The danger in riches is becoming content without God. The danger in poverty is becoming dishonest. The principle is clear when dealing with poverty. It's honesty versus dishonesty. But the distinction is not so clear with wealth. Why? Because we can become content without God. We become content with our money. God's attitude toward debt. Let's look at a good definition of debt. And that is this. Debt is when someone is has delinquent financial obligations. Therefore, money borrowed and repaid according to the agreement between the parties is not a debt, but an obligation. However, bondage can occur if other principles are violated. What about bondage through debt? One of the most common causes of bondage is the abuse of credit. Proverbs 22, seven says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. And this principle should tell Christians God's attitude toward delinquent debts. When someone borrows beyond his normal ability to repay, it is usually because he lacked the self-discipline to either save for the object or to deny himself a material desire. Then there's indulgence. And God speaks to the attitude, not the act. The fact that someone is in, adult, is in debt is the result of an earlier attitude. Luke 12, 15 is instructive. And it says, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Beware of all kinds of greed. Our Proverbs 21, 17 says, he who loves pleasure will become a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not become rich. Does this mean that God disallows any kind of pleasure or enjoyment? Absolutely not. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. What about avoiding debts? Is it scriptural to claim bankruptcy? It seems logical that if someone has incurred excessive debts and has a truly changed attitude, he should be able to start a fresh, doesn't it? Well, Proverbs, Psalm, sorry, Psalm 37 verse 21 says, the wicked borrow 
and does not pay back. But the righteous is gracious and gives. How is the wicked man described? As a man who does not pay his debts. Luke 16, 12 says, and if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? If you have demonstrated an inability to manage another's resources, God will not entrust you with more of your own. Is God's plan logical? In worldly terms, to avoid creditors, it seems logical. A common response of the borrower is, how will I live if they take everything? Psalm 50 verses 14 and 15 says this, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high. Call on me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. What does God promise? He will rescue us in our day of trouble. What does he expect? He expects us to trust or call upon him. God always looks into the heart of a believer. As one reads in Genesis chapter 22, how God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, it becomes apparent that God asked him to surrender all. God looked into his heart and saw a true commitment to his will. Abraham believed that if God could send him a son in his old age, he could surely bring his son back from the dead. Thus God entrusted to Abraham his kingdom on earth. When Christians transfer assets simply to avoid detachment by creditors, it reflects a basic lack of trust and a deceitful attitude. What about bondage through wealth? Financial bondage can also exist through an abundance of money. To those who use their money for self-satisfaction or hoard it for the elusive rainy day that never comes are also bound. The accumulation of wealth and the physical possession of money can become an, uh, an obsession, an obsession that will destroy health, family, and friends. Suddenly everything and everybody becomes an object to be used in the ladder of success. Job 31 verses 24, 25, and 28 says this, if, a, if I have put my confidence in gold, and call fine gold my trust. If I have gloated because my wealth is great and because my hand had secured so much, that too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment, for I would have denied God above. What was Job stressing as a danger in having riches? that our confidence could end up being in riches and not in God. What lesson can we learn about wealth and attitude? Riches cannot be trusted. Only God can be trusted. This attitude is not confined to non-Christians. Many Christians fall into Satan's snare and convert the very resource God provided for their peace and comfort into something full of pain and sorrow. As noted earlier, God does not condemn wealth. He condemns the misuse of wealth. There are different perils of money. Some are brought about by too little money, some by too much. But in either case, attitude is the key. But well, what are some conditions of servitude? In order to find God's financial solutions, 
it is first necessary to assess the problem. Too many times we treat symptoms rather than problems. Circumstances more often than not are merely symptoms of an earlier wrong attitude. A Christian can assess whether a problem attitude exists if any of the following symptoms apply. Number one, overdue bills. Anxiety, frustration, and worry are produced when family bills cannot be paid. Proverbs 3.27 is instructive, and it says this, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. Now, Proverbs 3.28 is also instructive, and it says this, do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give when you have it with you. Do not withhold from the ones you owe. Do not delay paying if you already have it. Oh, well, what about worry about investments? Now, this may involve not only investments, but also savings and anything else that diminishes a Christian's faith. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 is helpful. And it says this, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. God condemns the worship of money, not its possession. Luke 9.25 offers a similar sentiment where it says, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits? himself. Then there is the get rich quick attitude. Now this attitude is not one of application as much as motivation. In other words, it is not so much what you do as why you do it. It is the primary motivation work for gain or profit without effort. The symptom which surrounds a get-rich-quick attitude include hasty speculation, credit leveraging, ignorance, and quick decisions. God establishes two promises in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20, which says, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. The faithful man will be successful by God's standards. The hasty man will lose it all. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 22, it says this, a man with an evil eye hastens after wealth and does not know that want will come upon him. The one who seeks quick riches is hasty. God assesses him to be selfish. And then there's laziness. God condemns laziness and establishes guidelines for Christians to follow in their relationship with him. Proverbs 21, chapters, I mean, chapter 21, verses 25 to 26, describes this foolish attitude. And it says this, the desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hand refuses to work. All day long, he is craving while the righteous gives and does not hold back. This is the attitude of laziness. Second Thessalonians 3.10 tells us how to treat those who will not work. It says, 
For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. Do not provide even their basic needs. Just remember that this applies to those who will not work, not those who cannot work. There was laziness. Now, what about deceitfulness? Deceitfulness refers to not only purposefully lying to others, but also not being entirely honest. Our society seems to believe one cannot be both successful and honest. That is neither, that is another lie promoted by Satan. Proverbs 19 one says, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than he who is perverse in speech and is a fool. Here God equates a liar with, to a fool. There are no little or white lies in God's evaluation. Luke 16, 10 says this, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Dishonesty with money equals a dishonest heart. God makes a promise to those who deal deceitfully in Proverbs 20, verse 17, where he says, bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man, but afterward, his mouth will be filled with gravel. <laughs> a Christian must be faithful or else face judgment. A Christian must also be aware of the subtleties of dishonesty. To borrow more money when you already have past due bills is an example of dishonesty. Makes sense, doesn't it? When you're already over your head in debt, it is dishonest to borrow even more money. But what about greediness? An attitude of consistently desiring more than is presently owned or always wanting the best can characterize greed. Incidentally, commercial advertising is designed to promote greed. It tries to promote greed as being normal and acceptable. You deserve the best. Have it your way. Luke 12, 15 says, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Here Jesus admonishes us to be constantly on our God against greed in all of its hideous forms. And there's covetousness. Design that which someone else has. And it, that is most frequently promoted by advertising. And the advertising media promotes it as keeping up with the Joneses. You ever heard that? Got to keep up with the Joneses. Now, this attitude destroys many couples who attempt to compete with each other or others. The opposite position is given by Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, which says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourself. A Christian should be able to praise God for the success of another. Psalm 73 verses 2 and 3 says, 
But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. These verses give a good description of covetousness. We covet when we desire the belongings of another person. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11 is instructive and it says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. You don't even eat with one who calls himself a Christian and is guilty of these things. His lifestyle is characterized by drunkenness. And he's a reviler, just like a party animal. Or he's a swindler, always looking to get over, to get something from somebody for nothing. Don't even eat. You don't even have, and eat is the characteristic of fellowship. It's, it's the most intimate form of fellowship, is to share a meal together. You don't even eat with a so-called Christian who, who is this kind of person in his, in his lifestyle. Yeah, and it really does mean that do not associate with believers who are greedy, covetous, the hard pottering, partying type. <laughs> does this refer to non-Christians? No. You would expect these kinds of behaviors from them. This refers to Christians, unfortunately. What about some unmet family needs? Well, because of past debts, investments, or irresponsibility, the needs of a family may not be met. A Christian must avoid extremes. One extreme is to lavish unwarranted gifts on his family. The opposite is to ignore their basic needs. Those who give their surplus to any activity while members of their family go without basic necessities are outside of God's will. First Timothy 5, 8 says, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This means that any man who does not provide for his family is deemed a failure by God. Then there's the overcommitment to work. When we reverse priorities in our lives, we suffer spiritually and financially. The Bible refers to basic commitments. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Our first priority is God and his kingdom. Genesis 2.24 sets forth our second priority when it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and become one and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So your second priority, first priority is God, your second priority is your family, your wife and your children. Psalm 127 verse 2 says that work should come after God and family. It says this, it is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Go to bed, man. The evidence of priorities is shown in how we spend our time. Someone who spends little or no time with God or his family is serving the world. Then there's money in tank. And entanglements are the devious entrapments created by juggling the bills to keep afloat. 
and worldly commitments that keep many Christians out of God's service. For example, 2 Timothy 2.4 says, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. A typical entanglement in today's generation should be preoccupation with a business and the accumulation of money. Proverbs 23 verses four and five describes one who has at least temporarily denied the faith when it says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Seek from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. And Ecclesiastes chapter five verse 10 says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. And then there's self-indulgence. Self-indulgent attitude is normally characterized by irresponsible spending for items that yield temporary satisfaction and has very little utility. It can be a form of greed. Luke 12, 15 provides a warning when it says, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Well, not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. I can think of three factors that can result in an unfruitful life for a Christian. Number one, overspending. Number two, overwork. And number three, overemphasis on possessions. And indulgence is a purchase that has little utility to the owner. The unwise use of credit encourages indulgence since it is less personal than actual cash money. And, and, and business people in business know that. They know that you will spend a certain percentage more if you're using a credit card than they, you will if you, you're taking the cash out your pocket and handing it to them. They know that. That's why they all want you to have their credit card. And they'll accept any credit card you bring because chances are if you were taking that cash out of your pocket, that hard-earned cash, and looking at it and seeing it, you'll be a lot more reluctant to hand it over than you would with a credit card. You know that. Don't be used. Don't let yourself be used like that. The unwise use of credit encourages, yes, it's indulgence since it is less personal than the act than the use of actual cash. Curtail the unwise use of credit, and many indulgences will also start. If you just slow down. Slow down, slow down the use of credit. You don't have to have everything, even everything that you can afford to buy with no problem. You don't need to buy everything you can afford, let alone everything that you have to buy on the installment plan. Trust God. God owns everything. He can give you anything he wants you to have. If he doesn't give you if you ask him for it and he doesn't give it to you, then hey, you're probably better off not having it. Because if you would be better off to have it, God would give it to you. Or perhaps God is not saying, no, you can't have it. But he's saying you can't have it right now. Learn how to wait on the Lord. Patience. Be patient. Don't. 
put an overemphasis on possessions. Then there's financial superiority. Financial superiority is nothing more than a substitute form of conceit, conceit and self-exaltation. We don't usually think of this as an example of servitude to money, but it certainly is. Scripture describes not only its characteristics, but also its dangers. In Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 19, it says this, they will fling their silver into the streets and their gold will become an abhorrent thing. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their appetite, nor can they fill their stomachs, for their iniquity has become an occasion of stumbling. God views financial worth as accounting for nothing. Riches are the result of God's blessings and nothing to be conceited about. The first Timothy 6, 17 says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited of or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. What is God's attitude toward the rich? God is simply unimpressed. Then there's financial resentment. Many people in financial difficulty blame everybody else for their problems. In actuality, they have never come under God's authority and yielded to his wisdom. They inwardly resent God. Attitude, again, is the keynote in God's plan. God never promised that all blessings would be material. A Christian had better learn to accept rather than dictate God's will. Proverbs 15, 16 says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. God's greatest blessing is peace. Well, there's a principle about borrowing. Credit. What is God's attitude about credit? This area of finances causes more chaos in Christian families than any other. Let's examine credit from the range of God's will. That means we must understand what respond, responses on our part are within an acceptable range for God. Within that range, God will direct us to a specific response that is his will for us. What is acceptable for me may be wrong for you. That is God's perfect will, and it is a very narrow channel in the range. Psalm 37 verse 21 says, the wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. God's evaluation of someone who do, does not repay as being wicked or evil. Luke 6 34 says, if you had, if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. This side of the channel is to lend to those who cannot repay, but without expecting any credit. Luke 6 35 says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. Isn't that a great award to be the son of the Most High uh, than someone who demands, manning back, how long your father want my father all back? 
No, you lend without expecting anything back. The payback, fine. If you don't, chalk it up to a gift. God specs. God says to expect nothing in return. Not even what you love the most. These verses relate to the needy only. To the needy only. You're under no, no obligation by God to help people who don't just because they ask for it. If they are not in a situation of need and they have a very legitimate reason why they cannot provide for this need at this time, then you come alongside. If you have excess or sometimes you may even sacrifice something that you you know, would have wanted for yourself. You can deny yourself and meet their need. Luke 6.35 says, but love your enemy and do good in land, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. To read that again. For he himself is kind to ungrateful. And evil men, you see that? You have God as your example to follow. God is kind to ungrateful uh, and evil people. These verses relate to the needy only. Thus we discover that one end of the range in God's will is not only to be debt free, but to lend liberally from our surplus. Many Christians are debt free, but are still outside of God's will by virtue of their selfishness. All right, here again, we've reached the end of session three. But before we close out in prayer, let me again address those who may be looking who have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, not repented of your sins and, and uh, sought refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ from the wrath of God. There is no safety anywhere else from the wrath of God except being in Christ in salvation that can only be had by faith, faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Trust Christ as Savior there. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your idols to serve the true and living God. Jesus declared of himself, in John chapter 14, verse 6 in the Bible, Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. He declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the light. And he shut down every other way or so-called way to God as an option. There is no other way. He is the way. The only way. Because no one comes to the Father except through him. He also declared himself to be the truth. Now stop for a minute and think about that. He declared himself to be the truth. And if he is the truth, that means he cannot lie. That means everything he says is true. Everything he does is true. He's all about truth. And if as the truth, he says that he is the only way to God, then it would behoove you and it would behoove me to give serious consideration to that. You heard from the lips of the one who cannot lie, can only tell the truth, 
that there is no other way to God except him. Oh, friend, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. Trust him and be saved. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise in the blessed name of Jesus. It's time together, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would take the feeble, feeble words of mine and use them to help those who are struggling in the area of finances to find their way out as we obey and follow the principles that you set forth in the word of God. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.